Hi, everyone. This is Rachel Caruso, your guide into integrative shamanism. Today, I am continuing on with my survivor sponsorship interview series. So if you haven't seen the last few videos, I've actually launched a sponsorship program for trauma survivors to help them receive the healing support that they need. And in turn, it serves the whole survivor community, uplifts us all. The way it works, let me tell you is real quick, but I'll also link a video in the corner here if you want to have an in-depth explanation of it. I myself am a survivor and whistleblower of human trafficking, and I have set up a fundraiser for myself, but I also had clients or potential clients who were coming to me wanting to receive intuitive counseling sessions with myself, but were unable to pay for them fully or even at all. And so the sponsorship program works like this for every 125 US dollars or 100 British pounds sent to my own fundraiser. I will use that to help cover the cost of clients who are in this sponsorship program. These are the clients who are, you are meeting today. We have Kenny and you've met three others so far. So check out the fundraiser link in the description box and the video as well that explains it all. It's a great opportunity for the community to become active. I know you all have um, been feeling helpless and overwhelmed with what you've been learning about uh, the dysfunction and corruption of our world. A lot of people feel like there's nothing they can do or even just that feeling of overwhelm kind of then triggers a feeling of helplessness and hopelessness. And then we get stuck, we get frozen in inaction and we kind of end up waiting for something to change or waiting for someone else to do something. And so here is a very accessible way something designed just for you so that you can be involved and help trauma survivors. You've heard from some of these survivors, they're MK Ultra survivors, but everybody here is in the program because they are a survivor of trauma. So we invite you to take this opportunity to be involved and to have a direct impact. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Kenny to you all. Um, Kenny has been a client of mine for, I'm not quite sure, over a year. Since last May. Okay. Kenny knows better than I. Great. <laughs> um, so yeah, not, not even quite a year, but we've, we've done some really deep work together. And so Kenny, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, a little bit of your backgrounds and why you wanted to do this interview today. Yes. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, I never know how to answer <laughs> this question of like what my deal is, but uh, I am Kenny. I am an artist. I guess um, at this point in my life, I am on um, <clears throat> my healing journey uh, and also on a journey to uh, connect with like my heart and my body and my feelings and like, flow with them and like sort of I don't know like learn how to create a space for that within myself and then flow with that out into the world I suppose <laughs> um and the can I, can I ask you a follow-up question to that totally at what point did you realize that was how you wanted to show up in the world or that was what you needed more of to mm. connect to your heart and your body and to let that flow. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I think like it's been sort of a gradual realization. So I've had like, I've had experiences with like depression for much of my life and it's sort of uh, reached a peak when I was in um, university, like 
I don't know, however long ago. And at that point, like I just was suffering. Uh, and I realized that it was because I was not doing what it was that like I was wasting my time, basically. I was wasting um, and beyond my time, like wasting my energy because I was doing something that um, I, I did not truly want to do. I was doing something that was prescribed to me. Um, and I was ignoring the fact that I didn't like it. Like I didn't, um, find it fulfilling. And like, at that point, like I didn't even really have access to like what that feeling would be, what is fulfillment for me. Um, and I didn't really consider whether or not that was important. Like for my whole life up until that point, I had been essentially living for other people or like living for um, the idea of what I believed other people wanted from me or what society wanted from me in my own mind. Um, so yeah, it's been sort of gradual since then. And like, it's come from like an unfolding of realizing just, I don't know, like who I am and what I've experienced and how those experiences have impacted me. And I have sort of settled on this vague thing at the moment of like wanting to flow. <laughs> well, it's, it's, broad but at the same time there's it the nature of it is kind of broad flowing <laughs> but mm -hmm. still it's quite specific and it's different from what you were doing would you say it was like that bottom level of depression or the intensity of the depression that you experienced in university that shifted your priority to say okay I've been living for other people now is the time that I want to start living for myself what mm. what sparked that shift yeah, I think so. I think it was um, reaching, yeah, reaching low points, um, various low points that have sort of, yeah, led me to re-examine my priorities um, and re-examine like what it is that I'm doing and what it is that actually matters to me and like to what and ultimately, it's like, you know, to what degree do I really care about um, living for other people? Um, what's more important? you know, that, or like living for myself, being happy, finding joy um, in the unique ways that I can. <laughs> yeah, I think we all have to reassess our priorities when things aren't going well in our life or in the world around us. I think mm, that's kind of part of the, absolutely. even a character crisis that we're all in right now to reassess our priorities and and if we're living according to our values. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So what else were you wanting to share about yourself? I know I kind of interjected. <laughs> um, I mean, that, uh, uh, <laughs> I feel like I sort of, sort of covered it again. I never really know what to say when this question is asked of me, but like, yeah, I don't know. I'm me. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> so Kenny, what inspired you to reach out for services when you did about last May? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose, um, I, I suppose I could start uh, with like the, I guess, broader story of how I awakened to this, um, the reality of MK Ultra in our world in the first place, because that was how I found you. And then that's also very much related to the circumstances under which I reached out to you. Um, so I don't even, it, this was like, I don't know a timeline, but like sometime before May, maybe a year before. Um, well, actually, how do I want to? <laughs> okay, the the timeline sort of jumps around a bit because it has been like a very, um, just like a gradual and deepening understanding over the years. But it started when I was a teenager, as a teenager, and also currently, I was very interested in psychology. And so, at the time, I was um, I was looking into um, dissociative identity disorder because I didn't know anything about it, and so. Um, I don't know, I was like in high school at the time and I was watching videos of people describing their experiences and just like um, sort of like basic stuff, but I didn't look into it too much. I just sort of reached a, a level of awareness of like, this is a thing that exists, uh, but I didn't know exactly how it was formed um, or the ways in which it manifested or like the implications or anything like that. And then time, time passed and then years later, like in my early, earlier 20s, uh, I looked back into it again um, and I did a deeper dive into the ways in which it's formed, like how it's formed by trauma, how it's 
created when um, a child experiences repeated and excruciating pain such that their soul needs to sort of split off in order to protect itself. So this is at the point at which I started understanding the mechanics of the 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 yeah like the the psychological mechanisms of of the thing of DID. Mm -hmm. And so around uh, the same time, and it's interesting looking back on it because so many things just like that were related that at the time I did not know that they were related. They just sort of coalesced and all of a sudden like brought me to a greater understanding that really shifted my viewpoint of the world. So at this point I had a vague, I, I mean like, yeah, a general understanding of the mechanisms of DID. And at the same time, I was also looking into some true crime stuff. And there was this one case that um, really, I don't know. I mean, I suppose you could say interest in me, but that's not exactly the right word. Just a case that intrigued. like, yeah, intrigued me. That caught my caught my attention because I thought that it was very strange and it felt like something very huge was being missed or like being exempt from the story. And this case was uh, the case of um, John Benet Ramsey. Um, and I'm not going to go too deep into the details of the case but if you're unfamiliar with it you can look it up if you'd wish um because there is like a lot of information about it but i was doing research uh you know my own extracurricular research on this case uh, and i came across some information that and i i mean i i don't i can't verify a source for this information but it was very interesting and it led to a different it, it led to a different trail of breadcrumbs in the case, essentially. And so this information stated that apparently um, John Benet Ramsey, uh, her father in his den, he had uh, a book or like some sort of literature um, that was entitled uh, How to Create a Sex Slave with a Stun Gun. So I read this and I was like, what the fuck? Um, and so I looked it up to see if I could... I don't know, like uh, gain some information about what what it is that is. Um, and so when I don't I really know what up, to expect when you type that in the search bar. Exactly. Um, and at this point, I had like no knowledge of like, I just that just did not compute in my mind. I did not know like what that could possibly mean. Mm -hmm. um, so I looked it up and the thing that came up was uh, actually Fritz Springmeier's book. Um, oh, I keep I always forget the title. What was it? long but the illuminati formula to create a total undetectable mind control slave yes thank you i'll yes. link it in the description box below for people as a reference too yeah mm -hmm. the pdf is available online so that came up it's a super long book but i i saw the title and i was like what the fuck um <laughs> what the fuck um seems it seems related right and also it's I don't know. I don't know if that's still what comes up if you look it up. But anyway, so I started reading the book and I ended up reading all of it like in the span of like two days. And it's a very long book. So this was this was um, just yeah, it was very intense. And this book, um, as I was reading it, there's a lot of stuff that for people who are unfamiliar um, with this world, <laughs> um, there's a lot of stuff that seems um, crazy. Um, and there's a lot of stuff for people who are unfamiliar with this world that feel like unverifiable. It's like so outside of one's realm of existence or like one's one's conception of reality that it's it can be pretty difficult to believe. So I was sort of reading it with a sense of like, what the fuck am I reading? Um, but also in the book, um, the author describes, I mean, like, you know, as in the title, like the, and he doesn't go into supreme detail exactly, but he talks broadly about the mechanisms um, through which um, people are mind controlled through trauma, trauma-based mind control. Um, and it's through the engineering of dissociative identity disorder in children. And so I was reading this, and so in much of it, and he also talks about demons and stuff like that, and much of it felt unbelievable to me at the time, but also I had done the previous research on how DID is formed psychologically, and I knew reading it that the logical through line was there, and that it makes complete sense, and that this was a possibility, a distinct possibility. So yeah, I read the whole book, um, and... 
at that point, uh, he also talks about, and uh, I, I won't go into details in case it's like, I guess, triggering for anybody in the audience. Um, but again, if you're interested, you can read the book. He talks about um, very specific symbology that is present in, um, in, in the programming. And so I read this, I read this, and I took in that information. And afterwards, I went back to my research. Uh, and a lot of my research uh, was focused on watching people on YouTube sort of describe their experiences with DID and how that manifests for them and kind of what their internal world looks like. So I went back to that and I was watching various people and it like was very chilling um, the degree to which that this uh, Illuminati symbology showed up in the way that people would describe their internal worlds, like in just many very specific details. Um, and this sort of, uh, I mean, and it was a sort of over time thing where I realized like this is true. And like, uh, you know, I, I can't verify all of it, but there is at least like a line of logic that is true and like is verifiable based on other people's experiences, whether, I, I mean, I don't know whether they know that they're verifying it or not. I could see the thread of the logic. Mm -hmm. um, but. Well, Kenny, that's a great example of using critical thinking to analyze information that we're presented with. Because critical thinking is kind of like a lost art. Um, we don't really realize that we've been missing it a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. But you just were, you naturally had that skill. And so that's how you were able to move through those levels of verification with yourself. You know, nobody was was bombarding you with this information. Like, here, you can verify it like this. You can ver mm -hmm. verify it like this. You use your own sense of logic to examine things um, you know, cross-referencing, which was really smart. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, after that point, like, um, I started doing, um, yeah, I just started continuing to do my own research. And then that went on for a long time. And when I sort of, I feel gained, like, an understanding at which I was able to sort of explain it in a nutshell to people. I told, like, uh, it, it was just such a shift in my reality, like, realizing, um, and I, I suppose I haven't, like, made, I haven't uh, stressed this, uh, but, like, realizing that this thing not only happens, but happens frequently. It happens frequently and also happens with people but it and is undetectable for the most part, unless you know what you're looking for. And like the implications of like people who can be controlled by others. It's like, well, who, who are the public figures that we're seeing in our daily lives? Like we have no, there is no confirmation that these are free people, right? So it just shakes your entire worldview. And at that point, I felt like anybody who, like I, I could not have a conversation with anybody who didn't know that or didn't know that I knew that because it was just such a shift. I, yeah, like the- Your worldview, yeah. your sense of reality. Exactly, the, the sense of reality. So at that point, like I was just telling like everybody who I trusted, everybody who I wanted to maintain a relationship, I was like, okay, well, I have discovered this about the world, take it as you will, um, but this is what I have seen. Uh, and then around this time, as I was doing research on YouTube, I was looking up um, more specific things, like looking up, um, uh, I had questions about like why people's um, altars like were very similar to each other. Uh, but yeah, I had specific questions and I was looking those up. And eventually I found my way to your channel, Rachel, and I don't remember uh, what video it was. Um, but I found you and I watched your videos on narcissistic abuse. Um, and at this time, I, um, and I myself am a survivor of narcissistic abuse by my parents and, and by my family. Like the whole family unit is just, uh, it's deeply, deeply entrenched <clears throat> around the narcissistic codependent dynamic. So I started watching your videos about narcissistic abuse and MK Ultra. Um, and uh, realized that you were a healer. And so 
at that point, and as I had mentioned before, I like have experienced depression at various points in my life to various degrees. And I had gone to therapists and psychiatrists before, and I've never um, I've never had a great experience with them because I felt that they sort of fundamentally misunderstood me in some way that I could not exactly pinpoint at the time. Um, and at this point in my life, I felt that um, conventional therapy and conventional psychiatry was like even more outside of the realm of what I, I could be understood by, essentially. Um, so, yeah, I realized that you were a healer. Uh, and I thought that if I ever wanted to seek healing, I would go to you. But at this point in my life, I was just not there yet. Um, I realized, like, certainly that there were things that I wanted to... Actually, my motivation at the time for healing was that um, I had very few memories of my childhood. And what I wanted very specifically was to basically remember more of, like, quote, what happened to me, unquote. Um, and that healing intention has definitely shifted over time with uh, my work with you but yeah so I found you um but at the time I wasn't ready to to seek your services uh and so some time passes and this leads me towards the inciting incident of what actually led me to seek you out um so without going into too much detail because it is a very long story um there was uh I I lived in a in a house some time ago that was across the street from a Masonic Lodge. Um, and I experienced various disturbing things in that neighborhood and specifically surrounding the lodge. And frankly, the energy around the lodge was very uh, dark and at times like disturbing. And there was one incident in particular where I witnessed um, what I believed at the time and still believe to be um, a sex trafficking incident that felt very much related to uh, narcissistic abuse and control and also MK Ultra. again, without going into too much detail. So I witnessed this event uh, and it was traumatic. Uh, and at that point, and there was another event the following day that was even more inexplicable. Um, just like very strange um, happenings on the street surrounding the lodge, sort of the kind of like a in a theatrical fashion, even just like just like very strange things that um, people living within the matrix would not understand. Um, and so at that point, I had experienced like this this thing that I didn't know how to grapple with. I was feeling guilty. Um, because I felt like I had not been able to do enough, like I couldn't save this person who I witnessed uh, being a, a victim of organized abuse. Like I felt like helpless um, and I felt guilty for being helpless. And, and I felt very angry that, um, that other people in my neighborhood didn't really step up to the plate to do something. Um, so yeah, I was feeling all of these things. And this was the incident that made me reach out to you. Um, because I knew that you would be someone who would understand uh, and have the capacity to to help me. But really, I wanted to be understood, and I wanted to just talk about this incident. Um, so, yeah, that was how I reached out to you. And then we, we spoke about that, and then as time went on, um, our uh, healing relationship has evolved towards... Um, my own, um, I guess, uh, relationships and internal dynamics as they relate to the narcissism that runs in my family and um, the emotional abuse and neglect that I experienced as a child and also up until I started living off on my own and then the ways in which I perpetuate those dynamics in my adult life. Mm -hmm. I forget the question. <laughs> We, we were talking about how we came to meet, how you found ah. me, and what sparked your interest in uh, reaching out for services. And so it's always, you know, I always find it fascinating, even on my side, to learn, like, the, the events leading up to somebody making that point of contact, because this, you know, this is in the realm of awakening. And the whole world is waking up just in various ways at various speeds, but it is a collective energy 
with momentum that cannot be stopped. Therefore, we are all in it together. And so I always consider it um, a miraculous event whenever we do have, you know, whenever we can form these connections to address the real issues in the world and help each other awaken. So thank you for sharing some of the your some of your experiences and your awakening to the MK Ultra. Um, you know, it seems like it was in a kind of a condensed period of time for some people. It takes them like a decade to get to that level of understanding. But um, we actually had kind of a blessing in the um, apocalypse period that was sparked at 2020. Mm. Everybody had so much time on their hands sitting at home on their mm-hmm. devices. <laughs> they did research. Like I've heard that from a lot of people that that was their period of waking up to corruption because simultaneously, not only did they have time on their hands, but what was happening didn't seem right. It didn't sit right with them. Mm. And combined, it opens them up to this whole reality shift. Mm. And so how, what has it been like for you now Um moving through sessions with this understanding of the darkness that does exist in the world. Mm. It's made me more aware of um, my own internal darkness, Um, people's humans and my, you know, I'm not exempt from being human, humans capacity for darkness. And also um, this, this, and you made a video about this uh, recently on your Patreon, I believe. Um, this the one of the many disturbing factors about MK Ultra and trauma based mind control is that these things lie outside of the realm of conscious awareness for the victim. So when people who are are victims victims of of mk ultra don't know that they are victims of mk ultra by design and so when i realize that it opens up the floodgates to like what is it that i don't know about my own life what do i not know about myself mm-hmm. um and the answer is that we don't know what we don't know and that's very scary or it can be very scary um, it definitely scares me. And that's something that I grapple with like constantly. And I think that was like one of the motivating factors of like my initial intention of like wanting to remember, like just desperately wanting to know what I don't know. Um, but how I've sort of been moving forward from that is that you can't know what you don't know. And you also can't know what your body and your mind and your feelings like are keeping from you for your own protection, essentially, for what they believe to be your own protection, um, whether you disagree, quote unquote, you, whether quote unquote, you disagree or, 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 or not. Um, and so there has been in my healing journey, uh, I think, like a great negotiation with that dynamic within me of like, instead of just sort of like. I don't know, sort of like uh, barging into my own soul being like and like shaking myself by the shoulders and being like, tell me, tell me everything, you know, Um, (laughs) which is like not very interrogating yourself. Exactly. Interrogating yourself, Um, negotiating between that and being respectful of myself and respectful of my own boundaries that I keep with myself. Um, And interesting, Kenny, because. Kate, the other survivor, trauma survivor who I talked to in a previous interview, she said the same thing, that Mm. she learned how to approach conflicting aspects of herself or aspects of herself that she deemed to be difficult or with Mm. only with care and respect. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is definitely something that I um, have been learning uh, through my sessions with you. Um, and ultimately, it's like just uh, being compassionate towards oneself, which for people who um, are are survivors of narcissistic abuse, abuse of any kind, like that is can be very difficult uh, and feel very foreign. Yeah, if you didn't grow up with it, then it's not hardwired into you and you have to unlearn the harsh criticism and the self-punishment and rewire yourself for compassion, which Mm -hmm. is such a big part of healing. So 
So I think your explanation is inspiring for others to see that they don't ha- it doesn't have to be this dualistic or polarizing mm-hmm. thing of dark and light because a lot of times when people are c- confronted with the darkness in the world they run from darkness period and they won't explore the darkness within and they just want to kind of split off from it and go for all the light and fluffy stuff and in my opinion that's where like new age cultism comes in like that's the that's one doorway that's been designed to usher in that cultism um but you know as you're explaining your experience you you learn so much and you get the coping skills to face reality the fact that there's so much in the world and in ourselves that we don't know and so while it might be unsettling it's also rewarding to meet ourselves and in turn that equips us to to face the darkness in the world and to navigate it, to be a force of positive change. So it's not Mm. about being submissive to it and just accepting it in a passive way, but being a force to change because that was, that was the motivating factor actually for you to reach out for support whenever you, you experienced bystander trauma, witnessing sex trafficking and MK ultra such a you know such a heavy and difficult thing to deal with um you know there's there's definitely a reason why this abuse is just um perpetuated in the world because a lot of times we don't know how to respond whenever we see something wrong Mm -hmm. and when the cards are kind of stacked against us like multiple perpetrators and one of us but the more we journey within and explore our darkness and our light equally you know that power then we're equipped to show up in the world as a force Mm. (laughs) i love that (laughs) Mm. so i'm so inspired by you taking up that path on your own you know you didn't actually need um convincing to forge that character through healing It was more just about guidance in how to do that. So, Kenny, what are your current goals for continuing with sessions? Because we've been in them for about nine or so months, 10 or so months now, and you're definitely wanting to continue with them. At this point, what are your hopes or kind of general intentions in moving forward? Mm Mm-hmm. Um, firstly, I think it has been very beneficial for me to have a sort of, (laughs) um, sort of like structured healing time, um, because I can fall into, um, what I would describe as my old ways where I sort of neglect that part of myself and fail to nurture, um, yeah, fail to nurture that, which is like super important. So it's definitely helpful to have, a space that I can return to regularly, whether it's weekly or not, because sometimes it's not. Um, But yeah, a space where I can return to regularly, regularly where I'm sort of held accountable um, by, by, like, by really, like, myself, but, like, you know, held accountable for um, creating space for my feelings and really creating space for my truth uh, and a space where I... eh, am trying my best to be as honest as possible with myself, uh, with you about just how things are, uh, the reality of myself, my body, my, my mind, my emotions. So that sort of structure has been very helpful for me. Um, also, and then, uh, beyond that, um, my goals, uh, I feel like they're sort of um, nebulous and ever shifting and they change like with every session because we sort of go at it in like a, in an intuitive way, one could say <laughs> intuitive counseling. Um, um, but I think it's important for me at this moment to sort of discover um, for myself what it means to have a healthy ego what it means to have a healthy sense of self and what it means to be an individual and to be experiencing individuation um 
And I mentioned it briefly before, but like, I think this is like very important for me as somebody who grew up around narcissists and was put into the position of being, uh, of, of engaging in codependent dynamics with them. That sort of dynamic is, um, is very harmful. It's harmful for the codependent because you, you go about your life without living for yourself, without expressing your truth. That's why truth is so important to me. It's constantly lying in order to spare somebody else's feelings, in order to secure what you believe to be your safety. And like all of the, da, 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 like, I don't want to do that shit anymore, <laughs> essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's a huge, that's a huge goal for me. Mm -hmm. um, for now, yeah. Yeah, well, it's great that, you know, recognizing the dynamics of narcissism and codependency helps to kind of shape your understanding of where you want to move towards what you want to move towards and like you said um learning or having the session space as you know carved out time and space to connect with and be honest about what you're feeling and coming back to your body that's an important part of healing from narcissistic abuse because we deal with so much gaslighting our needs come last or you know mm. never they come after the narcissists and um so we're always being uh kind of minimized our feelings and our bodies our existence is being minimized and gaslit we're mm. disconnected from our feelings a lot so it's so interesting you know it, it can take I mean, the healing journey evolves. And to be honest, for for all of us, it's a life is the entirety of our healing journey. <laughs> they are synonymous. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think like there's an endpoint to healing or that you can be healed. <laughs> and it's actually it's a verb. It's in action. And um, there's no uh, state of perfection that will all reach. It's more a state of grace mm -hmm. to accept um, with love and compassion and even passion about it that life includes healing inherently and so it's really interesting to hear how your journey has evolved over the past few months and we don't know where it will lead hmm. but I'm really glad that you felt supported and have been able to begin the deep healing from narcissistic abuse and trauma as well I mean narcissistic abuse is trauma but there's been, you know, various aspects of trauma in your life, even the, even witnessing the human trafficking, that's mm. traumatic. Witnessing abuse is abuse. Mm. So Kenny, I'm curious, have there been any financial obstacles that have impacted your sessions in any way? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I... In terms of my own personal experience, um, something that I have been led to do on um, my journey of healing is to divest from a, a career, but really any career, Div divest from anything that impedes my healing, drags me down, creates blockages, or perpetuates my own trauma. So yeah, that I've been called <laughs> to do that. <laughs> to divest from those things. Um, and part of that is like divesting from a career, um, a career that I was doing actively uh, when I uh, started seeking counseling from you, a career that perpetuates my own trauma. Again, not to go into too many details for the sake of my privacy. Um, but yeah, like I've had to divest from that. Um, not 100%, but like for the most part. And that has, in that, um, in doing that is a commitment to my healing. And doing that also impacts my finances. Um, and it is sort of like, I don't know, I, I think like my situation, it's like uh, just one and I'd say a comparably mild example of how uh, survivors of trauma are like placed in difficult situations, like uh, under capitalism in this instance, like where you have to choose between like meeting basic survival needs and like healing. And obviously, like, this is not a real choice. Um, and I say that my example is comparably mild, because I'm still able to afford healing sessions. But it is like, it has impacted, like, the length of the sessions that I can not afford. And also, there is an added stress of like, can I afford to, to do this? Um, 
Like, can I afford to continue doing this regularly? And like, I don't know. And then there's also like, it ties into sort of financial traumas as well, which, uh, which plenty of people experience, but yeah, it's like an added stressor. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, um, just in my experience. Um, but yeah, it's certainly, certainly it's, it's impacted my healing. Uh, and when we're healing, we don't want to have extra strain on the process and the healing itself shouldn't be stressful. So mm -hmm. when there's an element of money stress inherent in accessing those services, that's not ideal. That can be an impediment to a degree to healing, mm -hmm. to feeling supported and having this. And there's a, a physical limitation as well to having services in the style and in the way that you require for example not having sessions as long as it would be ideal as long as it would truly benefit you we're always used to um to kind of um, minimizing our needs mm -hmm. and negotiating because if we have this material lack then all of a mm -hmm. sudden it becomes about meeting those material needs and everything else gets put lower on the priority scale. And mm -hmm. so you've made a commitment to kind of balance that so that you're not completely choosing one or the other. But it is, is still that strain and stress that is not ideal for healing. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you're also part of this sponsorship program, um, because we also don't want you to feel like there's... Um, you know, an ax hanging over your head when money dries out. And that will be the deciding factor for mm -hmm. if you continue with the sessions, which you deem to be crucial and beneficial for you. You know, mm -hmm. so the point is that money shouldn't be dictating our healing. That's why we have to come up. We have to generate community solutions. You know, not being a slave to, uh, that capitalism, that money cycle that you had been in and you chose to extricate yourself from, now it's just about co-creating other ways of getting things done, of getting our needs met. And everyone, that is why we have this sponsorship program so that the community can come together and we can co-create healing. You have now met mm -hmm. four survivors in this sponsorship program. So you know who and how many people your support is helping. And it actually has a ripple effect. There's the four survivors plus myself, that's five survivors. And each one of us has our own, or each one of us is like a stone dropped in a pond. There's a ripple going out and out and out. So that's a ripple effect from the supporters and the donors. It's a ripple effect from all of the survivors. So together if you visualize that in a pond or just dropping stones dropping stones we're gonna start making waves <laughs> that's how real change gets done in the world mm -hmm. so you know just like you were talking about kenny um you know finding ways to respond to unsettling things that's a matter of character which is also contributing to our individual and collective healing so I'm really glad that you were brave enough to put yourself out there to connect with the community and share your fascinating journey and where you've been and where you're headed. We don't really know what the future holds, but I'm really excited <laughs> to continue sessions with you. So I do hope that the viewers are inspired to be a part of this community movement. And thank you to everyone who's watching who is inspired to some form of action, whatever is available to you. And don't forget, we have this limited time offer with the program. So here's the deal. My birthday is on March 16th. Until the 16th, I'm running this offer where any donation of any size, if it accumulates to 600 British pounds, 720 US dollars, I will use all of that for survivors sessions. So while any donation of $125, 100 British pounds automatically goes to survivors, if we have a group of people who can contribute to smaller amounts, then we can come together and raise 
and amounts that will cover sessions for two survivors for a whole month. And so that's only until my birthday on March 16th. Let's see if we can do this. Literally, if every single one of you watching this donates $5, we'll make it. It's just 120 viewers donating $5. We can make that goal. So do like this video, share it, start engaging conversations about it, share it to communities who you feel would want to get involved. And if it's feasible for you to send $5, we so appreciate it. It makes all the difference. Thank you, everyone, for your attention, for your open-hearted compassion listening to these survivors. And thank you for your activism in actually helping them to fund their healing supports. And Kenny, is there anything else that you'd like to say? Yeah. Um, I, I would just like to say that community support is incredibly important. Um, we are all that we have. And there are many of us. <laughs> there are many of us, conscious, compassionate people. When we come together, um, you know, <laughs> we will make waves. Yes. Uh, and this like this sponsorship program, I cannot emphasize enough how good and like mutually beneficial it is, not only for helping survivors to heal, which is like incredibly important, um, but also supporting Rachel's mission in taking taking these motherfuckers to court for real. Like, yeah, very important. Um, that's all. <laughs> that's all. It's so Thank important. Thank you, Kenny. Yeah, I appreciate I appreciate you voicing your passion and care about the, this community project with survivors and, and my own mission, um, which I talk more about on my No Witness platform, which is dedicated to whistleblowing. So I'm not here to just blow hot air. I'm here to slay the beast. That is actually the name of my fundraiser help this trafficking victim slay the beast. I will not give up until I die. There will be changes um, in a big way. Uh, that's what I'm dedicated to, to the truth coming out, to survivors coming together, to hold the perpetrators accountable, which includes the authorities, the governments. I am currently held captive in a foreign country and the government is part of my trafficking. Mm. So. You know, it's by the grace of God and a lot of hard work that I'm here uh, to be a part of the community. I do make a conscious effort. Um, it's a dedication to other survivors and to the community, which is why I'm here despite the hardships that I'm going through. I'm not here just to survive. I'm here to slay the beast. And so thank you, Kenny, for... Uh, for backing that mission and for voicing your passion about it. Mm. And I hope everyone else can join us in this mission as well. Thank you for being here. And I will see you all over on my Patreon channel where I will be continuing to make exclusive videos for healing, spirituality, and also whistleblowing. All of my content is now mostly shared to there. We made an exception with this interview series, but all the action is over on Patreon. So come visit me there. Thank you. Mm -hmm.